we got better things to talk about today. So I'm very excited to introduce Skylar Reeves. He's the founder and CEO of Ardent Growth. Ardent Growth builds content marketing strategies and in-house teams that leverage data, machine learning, and creativity to produce high quality evergreen website content for B2B brands. His clients invest in channels that return sustainable compounding growth so they can scale while reducing their dependency on advertising. Today, Skylar is gonna be showcasing his total addressable market gap analysis, which is in contrast to a lot of ways that people have been approaching content gap analysis. I've taken a look, the approach looks super exhaustive very extensive and I'm really happy to have him to talk about this. If any of you have any questions or thoughts along the way, feel free to drop them in the chat box or put them in the Q&A module. And if we're going along and it's super relevant, we'll, we'll stop and talk about it. So Skylar, please uh, go ahead. Sounds good. All right, I'll, let's make sure the, you know, all this, screen sharing works right so all right screen sharing working cool all right so uh my name is scholar bernard introduced me thanks for the the introduction bernarda was a uh, very kind one thing i'll i'll say you know we we help businesses reduce dependency on advertising but um, i'm not one of those seos or content marketers who says like it's SEO versus ads. I think advertising still plays an important role. So if anybody is out there on a performance side or demand gen side, uh, you know, don't think I'm I'm coming at you here. So, all right. So we're going to talk about how we approached um, doing gap analysis, how we approach content planning, and really kind of telling the story about the problems that we faced that I think that a lot of other marketers, um, and especially content marketers, have faced themselves, including SEOs. So. The you know title is we're going to do a uh, discuss our TAM gap analysis and how we can get results without gambling our budget. So like reducing risk and uh, and reducing you know like we're playing like a roulette. So again, what we wanted we wanted to remove the guesswork. We want to be able to get better results faster, right? I think that's what we all want. Uh, we like to start with the end goal in mind. So you think to yourself, all right, we want to get uh, the best results possible that we can get you know, uh, promotions so we can, you know, get wins from our executive team, et cetera. And, but in order to do that, you start with the end goal and you start to work your way back to say, okay, what are the steps I need to take in order to get there? So for us, it was, all right, so we know we're going to plan out content, right? But the problem from there was how do we know what content we need to create to get the best results in the least amount of time possible? especially when we consider things like what content does Google want? What content aligns with our brand? What content do our customers want to read? What customer, what content are they going to read and actually convert on? Because it's not just about rankings, right? It's about how much value, um, you know, is that content actually bringing to the business, you know, moving beyond marketing metrics and focusing more on, you know, actual business metrics. So, you know, getting away from just stopping at things like, you know, how many leads is it driving? How many MQLs is this driving? You want to go beyond that. You want to go into Salesforce into, or whatever CRM you're using and start to see how that content plays a role into closed one opportunities. So for us, it's, we start though with, we have, we, you know, we want to get the content out there for SEO. And that's assuming that SEO is the right distribution channel for the business model. So let's say you're a product led uh, company, you're a media, you know, publisher, uh, affiliate, it works for affiliates and things like that too. You know, SEO is one of the primary driving factors because advertising kind of becomes cost prohibitive when you begin to try to scale it. So for us, it's how do we plan content hubs in the way that Google wants, right? That we're going to be able to avoid, you know, uh, cannibalization, that we're going to be able to compete with, you know, higher authority sites if we have a low authority. Um, and what's the best order to actually create them? And like, where do you start? Do you start with the you know, with like a hub or a, like a pillar page and then create your spokes or do you start with your spokes and kind of work your way up from the, from the bottom to the top? And then of course, you know, everything around how to internally link them and, and all of that. In order to get there though, I think like first principles, we always start with, with keyword research. We have to figure out what are people actually searching for? 
And, you know, there's things beyond keyword research, like using the tools, you can talk to your customers and things like that too. I think that the, one of the best approaches is to actually do keyword research, interview customers, not just recording gong calls or reviewing chat logs and things like that, like actually have conversations with them and then find where the overlap exists at. And that's how you can really bring, um, you know, impactful insights into your content that's going to resonate with the readers, but also has search demand um, along with it. So when we talk about exhaustive keyword research, what we're talking about is we have to think beyond, um, you know, I've, I was talking to someone um, in Superpath, Jimmy Daly's um, uh, community over there, uh, and they were talking about, it seemed like they were doing keyword research every week. Uh, when they were trying to come up with new topics, right? I mean, if you go look for something right now, like the keyword, how to, uh, how to come up with blog topic ideas, um, it's searched for quite often. And so that's what that was telling me is that too many people aren't trying to think about the big picture in advance. And when you don't think about the big picture in advance, how can you really come up with a plan for, for the quarter at least um, and really prioritize different segments of your market on where you actually need to be creating content, both from, again, balancing it from a search perspective, the, the business's current goals and initiatives, but also what your customers want. So in order to do that, you have to look at your entire TAM, your entire total addressable market. So for anyone who doesn't know uh, kind of what that means, um, <clears throat> a total addressable market is Basically, everyone who's like in the market who could potentially buy your product, but perhaps they don't want to buy it right now. Um, and then you have what's called a SAM, um, Scarceful Addressable Market. Uh, I think the easiest way to think about that is uh, a SAM is everyone who's in market and ready to buy, and a TAM is everyone else they're in market, but perhaps not ready to buy. So we like to look at the entire TAM, but if we go back to Kind of the beginning when it comes to the the hub um starting hubs and spokes i think like we've all seen this this model i'm sure a lot of us have read this blog post on um on hubspot i think it's from like 2017 and you know they talk about okay you want to create these hubs create these spokes off it internally link it all together and then magically hey you have this hub and spoke model and there's a lot of i think misconceptions about how to approach this and one thing that you know hubspot never really clearly told people is how do you know what needs to be a hub and what needs to be a spoke and what needs to actually be covered between each one of them? Especially, how do you know how to split out two different spokes, right? When you're looking at two different concepts, does that need to be on one page or two pages? And that was never really clear. And that was a huge frustration for us. Um, I come from an engineering background. And so I was like, okay, like there's got to be a way to figure this out. So, to give you an example is let's look at a topic like project management software. And then we look at a topic like project management tools. So then we ask ourselves, is this one page or two, right? Like how should we structure this? So what we want to do is we want to go look at the, at the search results and you're not just looking at intent, right? So you're not just looking to see, uh, you know, what type of results are showing up in terms of what sort of title tags you're seeing or anything like that, um, especially given, you know, how Google's kind of, you know, rewriting title tags more and more. What you want to look at is what are the actual URLs ranking and how much overlap is there, like, like similarity of over overlap between these two keywords. And the threshold that we can aim for is right around the range of uh, like if four of the exact same URLs, not domains, but if four of the exact same URLs are ranking, for each of these topics, then that's a pretty good indication that you can create one page and, and rank for both topics as well. If you don't see a high overlap, then that's an indication you may want to split these out. There's a little bit of nuance in there though, um, mainly when it comes to things like where are they ranking, right? Um, Bernard's talked about this um, in previous presentations he's given where, you know, as you begin to scroll down the search results, you'll start to see intent shift a little bit. And if you were to search a more specific topic, um, related to kind of the intent you're seeing at the bottom page, those pages begin to rank at the top on that separate topic. So when you see instances like that, that's an indication you can actually still create two separate pages too. But if you see a high overlap, especially among the top, say, four or five, um, uh, six results, then you really just want to create one page, not two. 
And so if we look at project management tools and project management software here, we can see that we have KISS flow ranking, proof hub, um, the digital project manager. But then when we're looking at project management software, we have Hive, PC Mag, technology advice. And if we were to look at the remaining 10 results, these do not share um, a high degree of overlap. I think they had like about one in common whenever we uh, took these screenshots. And oh, something to note here, and then you can see, you can kind of see the difference a little bit in the titles, right? So for tools, we're seeing tools, tools, and tools and all the headings, right? So, but for software, we, I think we see, you know, it's, it's just predominantly software. You're not seeing tools anywhere, but again, you don't want to just look at titles. You want to look at the actual um, URLs that are ranking. That's easy enough when you're just trying to compare two topics, but it gets more complicated when you begin to try to scale this. So let's say we're trying to compare things like project management software, project management tools. We already know that those don't go together, but what if we consider a topic like project management solution? So I think like the gut instinct is, is that like solution is seems like it's the same sort of, you know, idea or topic as software and tools. And maybe we wouldn't think to, um, you know, create a separate page for it as well. And we'd be right. So when we look at the overlap between project management software and project management solution, they do share a high degree of overlap. They have three URLs in common, um, just in the top like four or five results but it's still different from project management tools. And so whenever we're approaching this, right, we would want to create one page for project management tools, you know, and then a separate page that's covering the topic project management software and solution. Whereas if we try to break them out into three, we're going to end up oftentimes with a situation where the page that we're trying to rank for software and solution actually end up kind of competing against one another. And you'll see them kind of hovering around uh, you know, ranks like 11 through 15 a lot of times if they're written well enough um, with neither one actually winning. So it's kind of like that concept of, of cannibalization, but. So uh, it's not so easy, right? So um, again, the main issues that actually happen whenever you don't compare the SERPs and you're just kind of picking topics and going and creating pages is cannibalization is like one part of the issue, but that's that's actually, to me, it's more of a benign issue. It's fairly easy to uh, to consolidate two pages because when we look in our, um, you know, reports and something like HRFs or SIMRush or anything like that, like it's easy to see, hey, these two pages are competing against one another. They're both kind of sitting around uh, the second page. I should, you know, consolidate these into one. The bigger issue is whenever you're covering two separate topics on a single page, um, when they actually weren't two separate ones. So. The issue there is that when you're looking in your tools, it's not always obvious that that's what's happening because you see that page of ranking for all the keywords, but you have to look at the actual distribution uh, to see how well it's ranking, um, you know, across that entire set. And you'll often find whenever you have covered two topics on one page when they really need to be separate is that it's doing really, well, really, really well uh, for one topic, but not doing so great for the other. And some people may think, okay, well, let me just optimize the content, but you're really better off just splitting it out. Additionally, whenever that happens, you know, let's say you're working with the lower authority side, it's you benefit a lot more from actually breaking those pages out into separate um, into separate topics because it becomes much more focused, um, a focused piece of content, right? It fits into this entire hub and spoke model um, more clearly. You can internal link, and it gives you a way to kind of compete with the bigger players, um, you know, on the SERPs. But that being said, it affects high authority sites too. So. Uh, let's look at QuickBooks. QuickBooks has this like massive guide about expense reports. Um, it covers like everything, you know, starting with our, our standard, uh, what is an expense report that I think we're all, um, you know, we do, but we always kind of, uh, I think hate ourselves a little bit every time we have to do it, but you know, everything from what is an expense report to what should include, uh, to templates how to make them and then breaking it down into weekly, um, monthly by for businesses, personal, et cetera. So QuickBooks is an extremely high authority website, right? Well-established. I mean, they're the category leader in, in accounting with like zero is like, I think a close second, you know, but right here, that single page, it's ranking for both expense report template and, and how to make an, um, an expense report. Um, but it's not ranking anywhere on the first page. And so it, it's covering both those topics on the on the page, but it's not ranking rather. In fact, it's um, you know they're 
their advertising for expense report template because they're not ranking on the first page. Um, and so when we look at the intent shift between these two topics, we see that expense report templates, like this is just people who want to download a template. They're, they're not looking for anything else. They just want to download the template versus the how to is someone who's actually, you know, looking to, to learn how to, um, to, how to make one, not necessarily how to fill one out. They're looking how to make one. Maybe they want to make it in sheets or, um, or Excel, et cetera. And what's interesting here too, is that expense report template, when I was kind of analyzing this, um, um, not too long ago, some of these, uh, like, like this one, like the seven best, you know, they're covering, uh, they, they got like seven different templates, right. But like, um, office up here, like their page is just straightforward. It's, they give you like one template. And so th that's interesting there because it's like people maybe don't really want to be bogged down with a bunch of different options. They literally are just wanting to download a template. And so whenever you see that's the case, that may not even be, you know, something worth going after. I think it's still a, a smart play uh, from a brand standpoint to kind of, you know, put yourself out there um, as an option, similar to the way Smartsheet does um, with a lot of their content. But, uh, you know, when you do it right, you can end up with an indented link. And now you've pushed a competitor down even further, right? And, uh, you know, increasing the CTR like um, like Microsoft has done here with intent with um, office.com. Skylar, real quick, we have a question from Enrique. Yeah. This is, I think I know the answer, but it is, a, it is a good question. He says, at first glance, I, a content marketer, feel going with the comparison ranking highest can run against branding and product marketing guidance. Like we're not allowed to use a certain word like tool when referring to their offering, only solution or software. What? are you supposed to do when your SEO efforts are running up against branding or product marketing guidelines? Get a new job probably. I mean, the it's no, I mean, okay. So like there's, there's bureaucracy in every, in every organization, right. But whether it's SEO or content marketing or any demand gen, whatever, um, anytime people are talking about like, you know, we have these restrictions that are put on us. We can't do this certain thing. Like, I mean, one, figure out why, right? Like, is it like a legitimate reason or is it just a, because um, effectively when they say that, they're saying we don't want that money, right? And, you know, that's that's the conversation I've had with people in the past when they didn't want to do, you know, say even like comparison pages is, I said, okay, but well, you're effectively sitting on the, on the sidelines because people are having that conversation one way or another. People are still going to be searching for tools one way or another. And so, you know, you're voluntarily, you know, I literally would tell them, so like, as long as you're okay, voluntarily sitting on the sidelines, letting that conversation occur and your competitors, you know, take market share from you, then fine. Right. But that's not really the easiest conversation to have. Um, and sometimes like if you run into that over and over again, it's just getting extremely frustrating. Like it's a, it's a marketer's world out there right now. Like um, if you're a content marketer, you can, you can work, uh, and you, you know, and you, and you can write good content. Like you can get a job damn near anywhere you want. So sometimes, if you think about the, like the, your career in the long term, why not go work for a company who gets it right, and you know, be able to get results faster, have that on your resume, talk about your wins, build your own, you know, your own personal, you know, um, uh, portfolio and stuff uh, to talk about and accelerate your career career faster that way versus being kind of held back from the organization you're within. And again, I know that's not always like the easiest thing to do to just like transition, but it's never been easier than what it is right now. Content markers are extremely in demand. It's very hard to find them. And uh, you're, if you want more opportunities and it's too much frustration, then maybe explore that. But other than that, I mean, it's as simple as just saying, okay, we won't go after those topics. Like just kind of write them off your list and um, and just know that that's not something you can go after. I mean, um, there may be another, you know, um, alternative way to get, that uh, they ends up getting grouped together with it that you could tackle instead. But, uh, but yeah, that's, that's all I got there. So onwards makes sense. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so long story short here with the hub and spoke models, like it just, it wasn't, uh, it, it wasn't as easy, I think, as like, uh, the, as the article made it out to be um, back then the way I think people still think about it now. So it's where we start is 
we say, okay, like if, if we're, if we're seeing how much um, difference there is between all these different keywords, like let's start with exhaustive keyword research first. Let's just get everything that could potentially be within our market. Um, it may not necessarily be something that we want to create content over, but let's go grab everything and then begin to assess it. So the common way that people start to do keyword research, especially when they're looking at kind of filling in gaps within the market or expanding out their content is um, they'll go do um, like an Ahrefs, for example, they'll uh, go into Keywords Explorer, they'll put in a keyword, um, they'll set the volume filter to some arbitrary threshold, um, whether it's low or high, you know, kind of depending on, you know, how well you think you can break for something and then, uh, and, you know, and then set a KD filter on it. Um, but I don't, I don't really think that that's the best approach. Um, I'll go over why here in a moment. The other approach is people go into like the content gap report in HRFs or other tools, uh, put in a list of their competitors and, you know, say, and what domain or what keywords I'm not ranking for and then run that. Um, the problem is, is that like a single keyword can rank for thousands of topics, right? And so when you're just using something like uh, Keywords Explorer and dropping a keyword with a volume threshold and a KD difficulty, um, you're going to miss a lot of opportunities that you could potentially rank for, um, you know, just by the fact that you can only say put in even a few keywords. Um, not only that, it's like KD is, is an arbitrary metric, right? And it correlates more with linkability, not like actual business value. So, you know, there's plenty of keywords out there that have a very low KD that drive a ton of conversions. And so anytime you're putting sort of thresholds on, on it like that, you're going to miss um, a bunch of uh, potential business value as well. Um, and, it's, and, you know, it's just a very sort of, uh, I think, short-sighted way to approach it. Um, and then when we look at uh, the content gap, one of the big problems with that is that uh, you're limited on how many competitors you can put in, right? Um, I think it's like up to 10 uh, within Ahrefs. Um, there's uh, Ahrefs content gap um, analysis. And, and don't wrong, like, I love Ahrefs. It's a great tool. Um, the content gap analysis, their, the keyword database is separate from Keywords Explorer. Um, and so there's not as much data in there as what you can get from Keywords Explorer. And, uh, you know, you're going to miss all the opportunities that not only are your other competitors uh, ranking for that uh, maybe you didn't include in this unless you run it multiple times, um, but you're also going to miss all the things that the competitors that you, that you are looking at that they don't rank for as either, but are still part of your um, you know, your total addressable market. So this is what this looks like from a Venn diagram standpoint. You know, you're taking two competitors, um, looking at your keywords and you're trying to find, uh, you know, you look at the overlap and then you're comparing, um, you know, what are they ranked for that I don't? Um, when what you really want to be looking at is your, your TAM. So um, all of that within a content gap is a subset of um, what we kind of call a, 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 TAM, uh, a TAM gap, a total addressable market gap. So I'm going to go through an example of like how to actually approach this and do this. Um, we're going to use uh, ClickUp versus kind of the, the standard uh, set of project management tools out there, Monday, Reich, Team Asana, so on and so forth. So if we're looking at Ahrefs content gap report and we run it for all of those companies compared to ClickUp, and if we just filter it down to say that the uh, where we in, uh, with the include filter say only show me the keywords that um, that all of these are ranked for that have um, the words project management in it. If we look at that, we get um, just a little shy of, of two thousand keywords back that the other ones rank for that ClickUp does not. And um, if we go into Keywords Explorer, though. And we go to the, uh, we put in something like project management as a C keyword into the, uh, into this uh, search bar. We go to the matching terms report, have it show us all and set the, uh, the mode to terms match, um, which is basically says any keyword that has project management in it, um, in any sort of order, right? Um, if you want to get more exact with it, you can turn it over to phrase match, but any topic out there that has project management, show it to us um, if it's in the Ahrefs database. And so when we do this, we get 187,000 keywords back, right? So just initially, at first glance, it's like, okay, like clearly there's a disparity between like the number of topics that could potentially be out there, right? Um, however, in the first example, we're looking at all the things that they're ranking for that ClickUp isn't. In this example, we're just saying, show us everything um, in the database that has 
uh, project management in it. If we put a filter on this, um, which I don't necessarily always suggest doing, um, where we say, okay, only show me all of the keywords that are, uh, that have a volume of 10 or greater, um, that brings it down to 30,000. So if you're ever looking for long tail keywords, like that's the range you want to look in is that zero to 10 range. Um, there's tons of opportunities in there. And I think we all kind of know that, uh, you know, zero to 10 isn't always, you know, accurate whenever we look in our, our, our search console and things like that. Um, there's a lot of long tail, uh, good information in there, but if we just take this subset of keywords from that include project management from the terms match report, um, and filter it by, you know, 10 or greater volume, we've got 30,000. So what we then did is we said, okay, let's take these 30,000 keywords and let's see how many of them that ClickUp does not rank for. So in the first example with the content gap report, um, we had, like I said, just shot 2,000 keywords that um, Ahrefs was telling us ClickUp doesn't rank for that competitors do. Whenever we take all of these uh, keywords, the 30,000 we had left, run that through to see what ClickUp's ranking for that the competitors are, we found about 11,000. So it's significantly more opportunities to kind of dive into there. And that's just for one topic, like project management, right? When you start to think about ClickUp's like TAM, and I mean, it's even larger than this. You can dive into everything that talks about productivity, time tracking, goal tracking, team collaboration, team management, work management, et cetera. Um, it, it, the list can, can go on and on. And that's what it really means to think about the total addressable market. And again, the, real, the reason why you want to look at a TAM is because when you get focused on one particular area, like you have no idea until you look at things in the aggregate of where there are potential business opportunities that you may not have even thought of prior you know there, there may be other opportunities not only for um, that you know something that ClickUp can do that it hasn't thought about a way that it can position itself for from a feature set but also can help say like hey you know is this something that we want to add to the product roadmap because there's a lot of demand for this um, and given the way that, that they kind of operate you know they're trying to build everything into their their app I think possible um, that can help inform you know which which feature do we go after um, after next or at least which feature do we begin to um, you know, do research, customer research for and, and, and survey people to figure out uh, what they actually want and does that um, kind of uh, uh, coincide with search demand as well. So some quick tips though about anytime you begin to pull in a bunch of keywords like this is uh, you're gonna, there's, there's a ton of data, right? Whenever you, you start to approach that. So uh, you wanna think about how do you actually wanna ideate seed, seed keywords? Like how do you actually come up with them? Um, one of where we like to start, um, uh, like I said, there's, there's, this is separate from customer research. It's a, it's a good place to, to start as well. But if you're just trying to do something very quick, like just go to the, the company's homepage that you're, that you're doing this for, um, or your competitors, if they're uh, kind of, if you're an, kind of a newer player in the market, but uh, go to the homepage and start looking at their navigation and look at their website copy. So uh, when we do that, you know, we start to see things like tasks and, uh, docs and wikis and knowledge base. Um, and then let's go explore all the features, right? And when we do, it's like, hey, you know, we've got Gantt charts, dashboards, time tracking, mind maps, automations, et cetera, right? We can start to come up with a bunch of opportunities for comparison pages too, if we want to go after those. Um, they tend to be very high value. And uh, like I said previously, if, if your company doesn't want to do comparison pages, um, you just need to have a conversation with them about, uh, you know, that conversation's happening one way or another. Um, people are searching for it. So um, you can either sit on the sidelines or go participate. Now, once you've found seed keywords, um, what you would, uh, what we recommend doing from there is, let's say you put it in. Um, this is squirrel.com. That's, that's not a seed keyword. Um, the seed keyword here was actually project management. But um, if we put in, um, oh, I'm sorry. Let me take a spec step. So let's say you go to a competitor's website. Another thing you can do is, uh, go to their organic keywords. Um, you want to set the position threshold to something like um, a minimum of uh, where it's between, say, one and 30. Uh, that way you kind of filter out a lot of the noise. Um, set a fairly high volume threshold on it. Um, and then uh, we'd like to put in some, um, some filters to get rid of uh, some kind of junk stuff that'll show up in there, like related to site searches that we do that show up in keyword reports or people searching for like squirrel.com, monday.com, et cetera. Um, and then we sort uh, the keywords alphabetically, or you can do it by volume. And uh, you really just want to kind of look down through that list 
and um, identify like common themes that you're seeing across them. So for example, here we've got, um, you know, we're seeing project management software, but the, really the common theme is things like uh, software, software, right? You'll see that over and over and over again. So then what you can do is you can go into Keywords Explorer, put in a seed keyword like software, and then use filters to then filter it down by things like Gantt, project management, task, right? You start to include those and it, it'll find everything that's got software related to it that way. Um, or you can take the reverse approach where you put in things like project management, task management. Um, I would actually just put in like task or tasks um, and then begin to use filters to, to drill in further. But another thing you can do is you can actually export that list from the organic keywords report that we we're looking at back here. And by the way, you want to go to uh, the legacy organic keywords report in Ahrefs if you're doing this in Ahrefs, um, because currently the, the new organic keywords report that they have, um, if you want to exclude uh, filters, like you have to put them in one at a time. Um, same with include, whereas in the old one, you can still kind of use a comma separated list. So until they get the, the new version updated, I would still use the, um, the legacy version. Uh, but if you export that and uh, you can go build a word cloud with it as well to start to see like what a lot of the uh, common themes across the set are and uh, begin to get uh, kind of seed keyword ideas that way. So here's an example of just kind of building a quick word cloud. Uh, I'm not gonna, there you go. You see software management project, CRM, things like that. All right, so um, a notes, uh, like I said, we've got these, we have these filters here. We like to use exclude filters um, quite a bit. Uh, they help uh, clear out the noise and they help uh, prevent you from wasting a ton of uh, export rows and data that you may not, uh, um, you know, depending on like what HRS plan you're at. So um, some common exclude filters that we use are um, just like symbols. Um, and, the, and the reason being is that like, there's always, there tends to be a, um, a variation of this. Like, let's say you're looking at something like uh, with a dollar sign in it or a question mark in it or an ampersand, uh, something like that. There's, there's usually the, the version that doesn't include that as well. That's going to be in there and it tends to be searched for more anyway. So it's not as if you're going to um, lose out on a keyword whenever you do that. Um, you're just kind of eliminating some of the noise whenever you go to export data and go through a, a huge CSV. Um, it also helps you kind of avoid uh, those long tail questions that are on those like test prep websites with question marks and stuff like that in it that uh, aren't really worth going after unless that's unless that is your your business model. Um, depending on if you're focusing on local or not focused on local, we'll also exclude um, things like states and states abbreviations because um, like Ahrefs doesn't have the ability to filter out um, based on whether or not there's a local pack in the results. So that's, we'll sometimes exclude those. Um, you have to kind of be wary whenever you um, filter out some of the state abbreviations though. Um, things like, um, like PA, for example, like that'll actually exclude uh, keywords that start with PA uh, from your set. So sometimes we, we, we don't exclude the, the variations. We also take like the top 200 most populated cities in the US. You can do more than that if you want. We'll exclude those from HRS too. I think HRS has a maximum filter um, of, it's like around like 486 or 500 or so, the max number of things that you can actually filter out and exclude before it breaks. Um, but we'll exclude a lot of the cities again whenever we're uh, not wanting to get topics related to, um, to cities. So let's say, for example, you're looking at something like, um, I don't know, uh, what's something to do with like maybe you're uh, you're a national uh, national brand that sells car parts or something like that or anything related to cars and you're trying to rank for that like you you know you want to kind of get rid of the the local searches or i would at least do them separate and then you know if part of your your business strategy is to create local landing pages to, to drive traffic as well i would look at them in, in kind of two separate contexts if you're going to do that way um so here's an example of like what removing junk does though um and these, these are just like the symbols, the, the cities and the, and the states, not the abbreviations. So if we're looking at project management again, we've got uh, like 207,000 keywords. Uh, whenever we apply the filter uh, to exclude those out, that drops it down to like 181,000. Um, so that's like 25,000 export rows that we've just saved from our, um, like our monthly limit in Ahrefs um, and also uh, kind of save ourselves from having to go through um, whenever we begin to do any sort of analysis. Um, I will say, though, that some people will use the include filter, um, especially when 
the TAM is like super broad um, and it's really kind of hard to, to find seeds that don't include a lot of like just irrelevant noise, um, especially when it's like a synonym of something. And so they'll use the include filter. We would try to avoid that when, uh, when possible because the include filter, like, it's effectively what you're saying when you use an include filter is you're saying no to everything else. So, you know, what ends up happening is you can inadvertently exclude a lot of topics that you may want to go after. So let's say you used an include filter like, um, like software. You're going to exclude any of the um, keywords that were like project management solutions. So you have to kind of be wary whenever you take a, a start to use include filters. So example of that is if we take that 180 or so thousand that we had after we excluded junk, and we decide to add an include modifier for software, we're going to go from 181,000 to 10,000. And so now we're, you know, there's a lot of opportunity that could have been in that keyword set that we uh, that we you know, we're going to miss out on now. So. If you take this approach, let's say you do it for project management, task management, team management, right? Team collaboration, et cetera, you start to work through all this. Or if you're using different types of include filters to get more uh, granular, because that is one approach that you can use if you're using includes. Um, you're going to end up with a bunch of CSVs uh, that you're going to want to combine. And that's a, that's a pain sometimes to do in Excel or Sheets. Um, so I think we'll send out these slides to you afterwards, but a quick little tip. If you're on a Mac, uh, put all those CSVs into a folder, uh, right click that folder and uh, go to services, tell it to open up a new terminal folder. Uh, we'll give you this, you just copy and paste that into terminal and it'll automatically uh, combine all your CSVs into one and remove the, um, the extra headings and just leave it with one. So it's just, uh, it's a small thing, but uh, when you're doing this uh, a lot, it can save you, you know, um, 20, 30 minutes sometimes depending on how many CSVs you have. So, let's say we've done all this keyword research um, and we have, we have all these keywords now. So, okay, like, what do we do with it? Right? Like, how do we actually begin to like go through all this data and, and plan, uh, build a content plan around it? Cause like comparing the SERPs for, you know, 180,000 keywords, it's not really feasible. Even if we put a, uh, in the example that I'm gonna show here, we, we did put a filter of like, like 10 search volume or, or higher on it. I brought it down to like 25 K um, again, I don't, always recommend doing that, but uh, just for like the sake of the example, that's what we did here. Um, but still comparing 25,000 SERPs, like you, you can't do it. It's, it's going to take forever um, to do that manually. And by the time you finish comparing them, like the search intense player already shifted over the, you know, that time period and you have to do it all over again. So, uh, so we built a tool uh, to do it for us. Uh, this is the, the back end of it uh, during its, uh, its early days we we're building in, uh, I think we built it in Python first and turned around and rebuilt it in Go and it's got a little bit of Neo4j built into it as well. Um, uh, this is how we ran it for a long time, but uh, not everyone uh, here at Arden is a, uh, as an engineer and super comfortable running things from the command line. Uh, so we uh, put together a front end for everybody. And uh, basically the way this kind of breaks down the way we use this tool is we take all of those keywords that we've, that we've um, uh, just exported from Ahrefs and concatenate into a file and uh, we just drag and drop it and uh, name or file and uh, basically tell it's a, you know, uh, what, uh, what country and stuff we want to look at. We'll put in our target domain. We can put in competitor domain. So it kind of becomes like a, a more of a content gap report whenever you, uh, whenever you take that approach, um, except uh, we didn't put a limit on the number of competitors because uh, it's for ourselves. So, um, and then we can change around the grouping accuracy. So what I said, what I mentioned earlier was that when you're comparing SERPs, you want to kind of look for some high degree of overlap between two keywords, right? So um, depending on the industry that you're in, um, we'll kind of usually go for like a, that they have at least four in common. Um, and then uh, from there, like we can actually, we'll change the threshold sometimes too, to say, um, maybe we want to see that there's at least two in common in the top five results. And so we'll set that threshold on it. Well, sometimes we'll just kind of compare um, how we get things back. And so what this does though, is it takes all those keywords, it goes to Google and it extracts um, all the ranking URLs in the top one, top 100, and then begins to do um, a matching with it. Um, and we use, uh, like I said, we use Neo4j, it's like a graph database where we can start to see um, the similarities between all of them. That's, uh, that's what we're kind of looking at back here. And uh, the output though, for us, when we go to do our analysis is, um, is a CSV uh, that looks like this. We take the CSV, 
um, then put it into a pivot table. So it's easier to, to group everything together and do different sorts on it. And so we, what we end up with is we have our main topic. So you can think of this as like the page level topic. Um, we added the ability to do this subgrouping within it. And um, so this isn't, I think a common misconception anytime uh, some folks are looking at this, they think that this is like the hub and that this is the, the spoke. That's not really the case. This is the, uh, this is your, your spoke word. It may be a hub page, but uh, this is the actual page itself. You can think of these as like the sections of the page or like the different uh, uh, kind of questions or angles that you want to um, discuss on that page. So things like project management tools, right? Software project management tools, which is interesting because project management software was separate. Um, and then we have like examples and tracking and so on and so forth. Then we have variations. These are all the keywords that we actually exported from Ahrefs that get grouped together underneath this single hub. These are the ranking URLs for it. Um, if ClickUp has, in this example, if they had a URL that was ranking for this keyword, we get the highest ranking keyword for it and um, pull its ranking as well. And you can see here, they've got multiple different URLs ranking across this entire hub. We'll talk about the problems of that in a second, but what you can do whenever we get this is we can like get insights like very quickly for what we wanna do for um, existing content. So in this example, uh, click up for free project management software, they've got a page uh, ranking pretty well. It's got an average rank of four across this entire set of uh, variations. Um, ranking pretty well for this, it's all a singular page, um, but it's not, that same page is also ranking for simple project management software, but it's ranking okay, but it's sitting on the bottom half of the page. So what do we do? We say, okay, like, we see that they're two different, uh, two different topics from a, a SERP layout standpoint. We can actually go and create, if we wanted to rank for simple project management software or simple project management, we can just go create a new page that's, um, that's targeting that one um, a little bit more specifically. And that's gonna cause the free project management software page to uh, either become an indented link or end up getting replaced by the new page that we created, um, which would end up ranking higher. Um, here's another example. Um, if we're looking at project management software itself, uh, like I said, we have all these different URLs that are ranking across this like singular topic. And um, it's really because there's not really like a, like a one particular page they have on our site that's really tackling this term. And the, cause they're all ranking and none of them are doing that well. And they're all kind of competing against one another. And so whenever we see things like that, that's insight to us say, let's actually create a hub page um, anyone familiar with like nerd wallet, nerd wallets, uh, mortgages page, like it's like, go create a page that acts as like a kickoff point, like a directory for all these other subtopics, right? Go create that page. You already have all these other ones that are at least ranking in the top 100, except for one keyword here. Um, go create a hub page and then link it all together. And then just, you know, it's super simple to create it whenever you already have all the other content around it. Uh, here's another example, uh, where we've got. Uh, two different URLs ranking for creative agency project management software. And that's pretty long tail, but it's very specific. And I, I, I know the way I am when I search for things, if I'm searching for like project management software for agencies, project management software for, you know, for marketing agencies, if, uh, if someone had specifically made something like where they made it, you know, like the team, I think that's what uh, um, uh, teams did where, you know, it was made specifically for, um, uh, for agencies. I'm a lot more likely to actually purchase that product because it was made for me. That's my buyer persona, right? So um, in this case, they've got best project management software is ranking. And then I think they've got uh, this digital agency project management um, ranking. But now that I want to rank very well. And so it's like, go create a new page. Like that's, that's, that's a new topic, uh, you know, both of those URLs are separate. Um, yeah, it may not have the highest like total search volume or, you know, may not drive a ton of traffic, but it's so specific that it's, that it's going to drive a ton of value. It's going to have very high uh, conversion value. So again, not getting kind of caught up in the vanity uh, volume metrics whenever you do this. All right. So, uh, and then sometimes it's just very clear that like project management software for architects, they have one over construction. They don't have anything specifically targeting architects. Uh, architects, there's several uh, of the keywords within this uh, within this hub within this um, this group that should be grouped together that they're not ringing anything for at all. Simple. Go create a new page that's targeting that term. Um, after Good question, you, go for Skylar, it. Before going in, 
Um, lots of questions, really. I'd yeah. say uh, thematically, people are like, is this keyword research approach used in ardent growth? Can I buy this software or is it just for internal use? Yes, yeah, so, questions so we don't use it for ourselves primarily because I'm, I'm sure most we use it for all of our like customers and things like that. Um, I'm sure most uh, marketing agencies out there have realized that, uh, you know, trying to rank for something like marketing agency X city or best marketing agency drives like a ton of unqualified leads. So while SEO works really great for like our customers and clients, we don't, we don't use it for ourselves. Um, I think honestly, like LinkedIn and organic is probably the best channel uh, for agencies to use. But um, as far as like access for the people, yeah. So like we, we do this for like our own customers. Like we run these reports. We also have, um, we've been granting some like limited license access to, to agencies. We just make sure that we like really, really train them on how to use it. Um, there's uh, and there's like there's other public options out there available like I'll, like I'll be first say like if you just want to do clustering like go check out keyword insights that um, Andy and Saganta put together great tool for for clustering it can like put uh, do a lot of this for you um, we didn't we haven't made ours public yet primarily because we found that it really requires that you know how to give it the right inputs to get the right output and so we've seen plenty of times where um, you know people who were using other tools end up coming to us um, mainly just because they either don't have the time to do the keyword research themselves, or um, they didn't just, they knew that they didn't know how to be exhaustive enough with it. Um, and so then they just want us to do it for them. So um, that's kind of our approaches. We, we kind of do it for you. And um, a lot of people don't want to go through a ton of CSV data um, afterwards too. And so we kind of avoid all that, just do it, analyze ourselves and give them the game plan. But if you're interested in um, having a chat about uh, trying out or something, I mean, um, I think my email's somewhere in the, in the list out there. You can just look me up on LinkedIn, hit me up, and we can, we can always chat about it. So We'll put a, a note where you can reach out to, to Skylar specifically if you want his, uh, to talk to him about his tool in the follow-up email. Uh, so a comment, I would legit pay for all of those lists in text form to use in Ahrefs. Again, very comprehensive. Uh, all right. Here's a question. A, I'll just give you a list that I have a public guru card that has all of that in it. So I'll, uh, we'll send that out afterwards and, um, anyone can access that, that list and just have it for talking about, talking about the filters, the filters. Yeah. 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 We'll just give that to people. That's cool. Make everybody all right. Easy. So you brought up the example of simple project management and ClickUp's page of free project management tools ranking. Steven asks, why would they not add a paragraph about simple project management into the well-ranking free project management uh, tools page? So, so they can. So to take a step back there, like our general approach is to say, whenever we see that something is kind of doing okay within that hub, to actually try to get it ranking for it first. Um, because it may be the case that they're separate whenever we look at the overlap because no other competitor is doing it right, you know? And so we'll try to do that first um, to talk about that topic, maybe run it in clear scope, right? Like, see, you know, optimize it a little bit around that. See if that doesn't push it up. Because you want to try to get things that are ranking. I know a lot of times people will try to focus on getting stuff from like page two to page one. I try to focus on getting stuff from like, page one to page one, like our own page one, like that CTR rate is insane. And it's way easier to get from, um, uh, when you target terms that are like seven through nine, right. you try to get them to, and in, into the one through three, you end up picking up all that stuff that was on the second page ranking anyway. Like it just moves itself up uh, naturally and your, the value, um, like the return on your effort is so much higher, but you know, definitely I would actually say, try to, to get that page ranking for it first. But then if you don't, if it's not budging, and sometimes you can just look at the SERPs and, and kind of figure out, is the actual intent, like like what the user's wanting, is it separate, right? Kind of like we looked at earlier with like expense templates, right? And then like um, like how to make one, right? I mean, Quick QuickBooks was, had both topics on their page and they're not ranking well for, for either one of them. So uh, some, look at the intent first. And if you do see that it's, that it's different, a good example is sometimes you'll see free, right? But then simple is probably people looking for stuff that's like, it's not, they don't care about free. They care about easy. Like for, you know, for beginners stuff that's, that's not complex. They're just trying to do a quick project or something like that. You know, they're not trying to go use Scoro or, you know, anything like that. So again, look at the SERPs, see if the, um, if the 
from a buyer's perspective if it's, if it's a different uh, intent that they want. Well, one more question for key, you kind of answered this, but for keywords that are already ranking, creating new pages versus updating current pages, which one is better? So for keywords that are already ranking, creating new pages. So if it's, if it's, um, if it's already ranking, you wouldn't necessarily create a new page for it. You would usually just optimize that page if you want to get more lift from it. I think I've got an example in here too, that'll uh, kind of showcase that. Um, because part of the one of the like steps that you have to do once you actually have all this data is you need to uh, you actually have to do keyword mapping and figure out okay now based on um, you know all of these main keywords I'm looking at like what's the best URL to map this to and then once you do that you're able to figure out you know which pages need to be optimized versus which pages like don't if they don't have a URL if you've already mapped all of them right even though it's got ones ranking for it but you've already mapped that URL to another main keyword that was like a, you know, just the best fit for it. Then that tells you, okay, you can create a new piece of content here um, and or consider like consolidating or collapsing. But yeah, you have to kind of do the mapping piece first and, and that's, that can be uh, tedious. Um, we know we've gone through and done it. So, uh, but it really, until you, until you actually map things out, like it's, it's really hard to, uh, to have clarity on, do you already have a, you know, like when you're looking at two different keywords and you're going through all this data, it's hard to remember like, yeah, but which URL, like, or which, uh, which main keyword is that URL, you know, best to go with was it, you know, I think it went with this and you're scrolling back up and down. So, um, so what we do is we tell people, uh, like we did it for a long time in like Google Sheets and Airtable. I'll, I'll show you that in a second, but, uh, then we've like built this like quick, like little prototype and retool. If, if anyone doesn't, hasn't tried retool, like go check it out. It's really awesome for prototyping. Um, uh, anytime you want to like manipulate data from an API or from BigQuery or Snowflake or whatever, um, super fast to build prototypes. And then from there, we'll, we'll, we'll push it on to uh, get it in development, actually build into the app. But um, it took me like forever to come up with like a formula that would give me a way to map keywords, like to try to like automatically map them. Um, and then we just go through and confirm. So in this example, it's like, we run it through, it tells us like best time to take robotics goes with best time to take robotics. Yep, that's right. You know, we'd go through and check, check, check them, hit save changes that writes it to the database. And when it does, it takes all of the other main keywords that those URLs ring for and says, now they're not part of the consideration set. So now we're able to see which main keywords no longer have URLs. Um, whereas the, the formula as it initially stands says, it looks to find like, it's a balance of a bunch of different things. Cause you can't just look for things like what's the best ranking URL for this? Like there may be a quote unquote best ranking URL for it, but it based on what? Based on uh, across all topics, right? And cause when you do that, you end up with, um, this is hard to like kind of explain a few words, but when you're looking at a huge keyword set for a, for a cluster, you're gonna have a lot of keywords in there that have like 10 or less search volume. And so you may have a page that's doing really, really well for the low search volume terms, but not doing very well for kind of the head terms. And like, that's where a bulk of the weight is, not in terms of value, but in terms of understanding is Google seeing you as a topical authority on that topic, right? And so what we did is we said, okay, we built this formula that balances things like, what's the top quartile? Like what's my ranking distribution of top, across that top quartile? Um, how many variants isn't, how does it bounce out across the rest? Um, what's the value of those? Um, how many other keywords does this URL ring for? Work all that math out, spits us out. And then again, we kind of have to, this is where humans are still in the play. We're not replacing them with machines yet, right? Where we have to do a spot check and confirm it. But again, if you don't do it that way, like the way that we were doing it previously is we would uh, run some queries in Google Sheets and um, uh, basically take the data, uh, create an error table, a main keyword table that has all the main keywords, a, a URL table with all of our uh, URLs. And then we go through and, and, and map that way um, to, to figure out which is the best one because uh, doing an error table is a little better than sheets because at least an error table, whenever you do actually map a URL to a keyword, it works like a relational database. And so if you end up trying to map the same URL to, an, um, to another keyword, it, it'll show it to you that you've already mapped it um, to one per hour. Uh, now, like I said, when you're trying to cluster keywords, uh, if you just want to do that part, like is that like a, you know, check out keyword insights? Um, where what we like that was like the once we first got things closer, we we're like, okay, cool. But like now what? 
and that seemed to be like a recurring theme. It was like, okay, but like, how, like, what do we do? How, what order do we go in? How do we now like maximize um, our time, our effort, our budget, et cetera. And so, um, so we built a priority score. Uh, we want to know like, where do we go to get high impact, low effort, right? Um, whether that's for like new opportunities. Um, so like we built this priority score into it. It basically sorts it in the order to say, this is where you need to start. Um, it applies to both creating new content as well as um, like refreshing or optimizing um, existing content. So at this point, we've clustered everything together. We have mapped keywords and now we're trying to determine the actual plan, right? And this actually doesn't take that long to do. Um, like for us, uh, like doing something like this, like for ClickUp, like takes less than like two days to do. Um, and that's including like all the mapping as well. Um, and then like planning out, here's what your plan needs to look like if you want to, you know, optimize these pages um, or produce new content. But the priority score will say, okay, um, when we see that a page is ranking really well for a keyword and has a high priority score, that means like we just need to go optimize that page if we want to fill in some additional um, keyword gaps and get it, get more lift from it. It's going to be a lot faster. Um, and the way we kind of prioritize this, I can't go like fully into it because it's like, it's like the one thing that I think like gives us a little bit of a moat um, is that we're effectively came up with a way to calculate topical authority to figure out like if you go and create this new page, like you will ring for it very, very fast. Um, so it tells us like how we actually need to build out these hubs um, to get results um, faster. And, uh, and like when you do that, if anyone familiar with like opportunity costs, right? Like we reduce that, which means we make more, more money in the long run. So it's also easier to get like continue to get buy-in uh, from people whenever you get them results faster. So uh, this is an example like on ClickUp, right? Where project management software we looked at earlier, right? It's not ranking very well. Um, if we go look at that page, um, like if we, if that same, uh, if we look at agile tools, like it's ranking kind of, that was the one that was kind of ranking okay, like around ninth. Uh, if we look at it though, it's like the page looks fine. Like, and like, if we go through all the content, like it's pretty well written. Um, we just want to know like, why is it doing rank nine? Why is it not ranking better? Um, if we look at the SERPs though, for agile project management um, tools, we're seeing best, 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 right? This is that perspective thing. This article is talking about top. And so if we then go search for top agile project management tools, what do we see? We still see best, best, best. And so like, this was like the highest priority thing um, uh, in the set that we looked at. And what's really nice about this is like, uh, we didn't do this for ClickUp, but we did it for some of our, uh, we did it for plenty of our customers where sometimes like when we talk about high impact, low effort, we really mean low effort. So it's literally sometimes as simple as saying, let me go update the title in H1 of this page. And, and all of a sudden it just shoots up. Um, it gets, it gets more complex and difficult to kind of optimize stuff as you work your way down through the priority list, but it starts with high impact based on traffic opportunity, value opportunity, things like that, along with how easy is it going to be to actually do. Uh, so when you're working on like complex updates and new content, once you get to that point, that's where ClickScope comes in, right? Now you know what keyword to put in, in there, right, to get, uh, to get the, the best output from ClearScope because the way that it crawls results and pulls in data and extracts entities, so on and so forth. You put that keyword in there and then you go, it's business as usual, right? Um, you go create your content. The one nice thing that, um, that has helped us like enhance ClearScope for us with this cluster is that not only do we know, okay, like what keyword to put in and like what order should we create content in, but also tells us what content we shouldn't be including in that article. Um, even though our competitors might be. So, you know, if you're ever kind of looking to see, you know, how they structured their article or whatnot, um, you'll see maybe they're covering a topic uh, and that, in a, you know, in part of the page that it isn't really, doesn't really belong to this section. It belongs somewhere else in another page. And so what we do when that happens is we may briefly mention it in a paragraph and then internally link to the page where it actually, where that subtopic should be discussed. So then uh, last thing here, kind of wrap up and I'll answer some more questions. It's like, is, is all this worth it, right? It seems like it's a, a lot of work. It's like, yes. Like I said earlier, like getting stuff from page four to 10, uh, or I meant from ranks uh, like four to uh, four to 10 into that one to three range, like that CTR delta between 12 and eight is like barely over a 10th, right? So if you're trying to get from page two to, to page one, um, you're looking at like a 10th of a percentile point in terms of like the click through rate difference. That's barely any traffic. You contrast that just going from rank four to rank three, 
like on average, like the CTR difference is like, it like doubles, right? So, you know, that ends up being, you know, you can like literally double your traffic going from rank four to rank three. So yeah, definitely do it. Here's an example of how all this works and like why it's worth it, why we do it. Um, we went after this like best X for Y topic. It's like 41K search volume per month. Um, whenever you look at the entire cluster though, uh, it's like 190, right? Because there are all these other topics that get grouped into it. So, you, you know, those thousands of keywords you can rank for. Um, this was for a brand new page we we're going to create for a client site. We went and created it, published it. Within four days, it's ranking on the first page. And we've done this like across about, I think across our customers right now, we're looking at about 30 examples of, of this happening. Um, over like the past like like three months where we're just able it's just ranking usually within uh, usually within 14 days we're, we're cracking onto the first page for for a lot of terms there are outliers of course but uh the reason why it's doing this though is not because the content is i mean don't wrong we, we make good content um if you a note on that is if you're ever making content you don't think that you can make it better than competitors like just don't do it um like your goal should be to make the best damn piece of, of content on the web whenever you create it. But beyond that, the main thing that actually speeds up the ranking um, is the fact that the priority score tells us what is the most topically relevant thing um, that we should create next based on our current topical authority. So to, and from Google's perspective, it's like this is like the most natural next um, thing that we would expect you to write. And so they're not trying to assess like, you know, um, EAT as much on it or, you know, or things like, you know, uh, should, is this a new topic that your brand is going after? Now it changes whenever you try to go into a brand new category. Um, but if you're staying kind of within that, that same, you know, main, uh, core theme, you're able to just rank really, really fast. So, uh, and that's, this isn't like a non-competitive SERP either, either like in this example, like we got like, you know, I think DR is like 90s, 80s, et cetera. Like everything's above 80. And then there's us at DR25, right? So um, it's that's like another big help too because we're able to not spend as much budget on links and things like that. Um, we actually like don't build links until like it's absolutely necessary. We create the content first in the priority order, uh, see where it ranks, um, see how it begins to climb. And then if we need to build links, we'll build links to kind of push it up further. Um, the goal here from now is to get it from there to, to like top three though, right? So um, here's an exa another example where we did like a refreshing project. Um, I think we refreshed like something along like 50 pages across this uh, this client site, but this is just one particular page. It's like their main uh, money page um, that like drove the most leads uh, for them. Um, and we refreshed it. it. took like 20 minutes to refresh this page. It was like the highest thing in our party score. Um, I think we updated the title, uh, ran it through ClearScope, um, you know, bumped up a little bit, I added like a few more screenshots to like cover this one section that wasn't very clear. Uh, it took like 20 minutes to do. And like literally within two days, like it just started, it, it like started shooting up in terms of um, keywords and traffic. Uh, last one here, uh, this is like one of the largest sites. Um, the bigger the site and the more content you have, the better like this approach works because it's, it's a larger TAM. We're able to uh, go through and crunch more data and uh, one nice thing about it too is like the way we built the algo was we can do like we can we can cluster i think around like 10,000 or so keywords in about 300 of a second so a lot of times we're looking at usually tams of um you know half a million a million plus keywords that we're going to have to to cluster so it's still pretty fast but this is a um this is a company with a very large tam it's a very horizontal business um started working on, you know, producing new content, um, updating existing content over the course of um, six months, um, increased their like click, the actual clicks like by 2.2 million from organic. So, so yeah, like it definitely works. It's definitely helpful. Um, and uh, yeah, any, any questions? Wow, Skylar, that was, that was something. It just has my mind buzzing. It's like, ah, oh, what is this? This secret magical topical authority sauce that, that you have going yeah. on. But you know, that's, that's why, that's why you do what you do and people pay you <laughs> to do it. Yeah, so yeah. that's, I'll leave that at that. Um, there are some, some questions that have been trickled in throughout the presentation that I've been saving for now. And one of them as asked by Steven, he's like, if the keyword is not in Ahrefs database, will you still be able to add that to your tool? Are there 
other places that you would be looking when you're building your seed keywords yeah. for this particular exercise? Yeah, so I didn't cover it all here, but because uh, I, I try to like use some examples that most people have. So like we built a uh, one of the best places to go to Search Console and extract everything from it historically. Um, especially if you can line up at the URL level. So we take all the GSE data at the keyword neural level, um, uh, have it sent through the APIs into BigQuery to store it in our data warehouse. Um, we use both Snowflake and BigQuery, but BigQuery is better for when you're just trying to do anything with Data Studio or anything like that. But um, send it all over there and then um, line up the, the keywords and the URLs uh, through that using um, you know some timestamps and other sort of methods. From that, you can get like usually like 13 to like 18 X, the number of like keywords that do not exist in Ahrefs database. And so like, that's a really great place to start. Um, and we just add them to the list and go crawl the SERPs for them and get the data back on those as well. You kind of have to, you know, you don't have necessarily like the best data in terms of volume estimations and things like that, but it's okay. It still ends up like with the cluster that it, that it wants to go to. Usually if the keyword does have any sort of uh, search volume at all, like it's going to be, in the tools and Ahrefs has gotten a lot better recently at how quickly that they can pull in say like trending terms because they're they're connected to more people's GSC accounts now so they're they're able to get they're not completely oh, relying upon right. clickstream anymore yeah it's like they don't have to wait on clickstream you know clickstream doesn't even like exist anymore right so uh, so they've they've improved that but if you're in like a super like fresh you know news fresh is going on all the time like you're really doing like more PR than anything anyway. So, um, but we'll use GSC, uh, we'll take, we do some similar to the way that ClearScope works with the, uh, the way it finds other opportunities where we're um, iterating through um, auto suggest results on Google. Um, we'll give it some seeds and have it just start appending questions and changing the, uh, you know, the modifiers out to find additional topics that way. Um, it's actually really useful. Uh, usually most things that you find in Google ads, like are gonna, like there's there's some stuff in there uh, from like the um, the like the ads explorer or whatever that's that's not in Ahrefs. It's valuable from there because then you can if you're running Google Ads you can get a sense of conversion data. Uh, the cluster actually is really really helpful for Google Ads too because you can figure out like how you actually need to put keyword um, groupings together. Like or once you see like one keyword doesn't convert well, very well, you go look at the set that that one belongs to and that's probably not going to convert well either. And now you all of a sudden can like, you don't have to like iterate and test as much and uh, you can add stuff to your negative list faster when you're going through like a learning phase. Uh, yeah. SimRush, SimRush is another route. Yeah, there's, there's a ton of different routes. So Yeah, I think the using AdWords data, specifically running basically tight, broad modifier match campaigns yeah. with ex like strong exclusions will get yeah. you a very good seed keyword list with conversion data that's associated with it. And I typically like to start there. It's of course more expensive in the sense that you, you need to be running AdWords campaigns for like a month or two to pull out as many of the right like impression data and conversion data as possible. And then another source that we used when we were doing search engine optimization consulting is that we would scrape the sitemaps of competitors yep. and then parse out the, the URL structures and then use those in kind of the, it would, the technical term would be an n-gram, but that's yep. just saying yeah. cutting yeah. out each specific word and then mixing yeah. them and matching them. And then I know another, if you want to just get super exhaustive, is that you would then scrape all of the content on, on those pages right, yeah. and then engram those and then have basically a keyword density of all of the like lexicon of um, possible like possibilities, which then you could imagine like, I'm like starting, <laughs> this is not to... Yeah to detract from your, your topical authority, but I can see how this can then lend itself to uh, insights into how you should want to create your next topics if you are doing that on your own website. Right, yeah, there, you know, whether you're looking at competitors and breaking, you know, you can start the high levels like URLs, right? Get that, create, you know, engrams, biograms, trigrams, you know, all that from that. Then you maybe next step, go to get the, extract the titles in the H1s, right? And then kind of go onto the content or like, yeah. you know, work your way through it. But I think most websites, like two things in that one, if you're in a competitive enough market where 
that's like what you feel you need to do. Um, you're, you can probably just get more lift by expanding internationally a lot of times, you know, and that opens up an entire new set of keyword opportunities for you. Right. So um, like if, you know, if that's worth considering, I'd go that route first beyond that too, is that whenever you like, even, even though HOS that isn't like say complete, like we've, there's, when you create the content and you have the hubs that way, it's less about like knowing what all the opportunities helps from the perspective of getting a sense of one, it helps with like, when we're calculating our, our topical authority score, our priority score, our, we have a relevancy score too, that goes to look to see like, our like how many competitors are ranked for this to, to calculate relevancy, but also looks at things like what would the value of this traffic be? So whenever you are looking at it, um, maybe you're in a very horizontal industry and you're trying to figure out um, like there was like an e-commerce website we were working with and they're, you know, it's like, well, we're trying to launch a new product line. It's like, what product line, right? And so we can tell them like, hey, here's an opportunity for you. Go do this, right? Um, it can help make those decisions because then you can look at the way that looks, um, at the way each like product line or category or feature set option, right? Could actually, um, when you're making business decisions for the next, for annual plan, you know, next year, the next five years, et cetera. But even though you don't have all the data, you have enough that when you do take that route and create that content, all the other stuff that maybe isn't database, that's all the stuff that you end up finding in search console, right? That wasn't in Ahrefs so anyway. Like you pick that stuff up as a byproduct, um, you know, either way, so. Yeah, yeah. One question in the chat is, what's the difference between your tool and Keyword Insights? Yeah, so the, the main one is, um, so like we tell people, like a lot of people come to us are like, hey, when are you going to launch this as a SaaS? I'm like, yeah, probably not. I don't really want to run, run a SaaS company, but we tell them like, go check out Keyword Insights. Um, like if you want to do it yourself and like, if you just want topic clustering, right. And I think they're adding, they've, they've got like, you know, they have a hub and spoke and they, they have volume and stuff like that in there too. Like if you want to do your own keyword research, give it the input, have it run it together and then, and then like plan it after the fact. So if you're like, you're, if you're the in the weeds technical SEO person, it's a great tool to go use. Um, People come to us usually whenever is because of our priority score primarily. So it's like we have clustering, right? But we also can tell you like what to go right next so that you can rank for it really, really quickly. And, you know, that's that's kind of like the, the trade-off there is um, it's like when you want to remove more of the guesswork, I guess, from the equation instead of just saying, all right, I got all these hubs. Uh, what page did I write first? Um, so when you want to maximize those results or a lot of times it's when people uh, – just don't, when they want us to do the keyword research, right? They want us to kind of yeah. manage that process where they're not going through the data and what we give them back are basically, here are your content briefs, here are your optimization briefs about what you need to go do. Here's your content plan and like all the numbers associated with it so they can get, you know, buy-in from executives and stuff too, so. Yeah, totally. All right, I have one final question for myself. How do you think about keyword or search intent cannibalization with this particular approach yeah. like it's a broad high level question because it's it's very nuanced but you know what what are you doing to to defend against it when when it does happen you know what are you doing to you know defend against it from happening what are your thoughts on it so are you referring to things like um Kind of like what you talk about, like when it comes to perspectives, or are you talking about whether it's like this mixed, this very wide mixed intent on a broad term, or can you elaborate? Yeah, yeah. I'm talking about like this, you pointed out project management software and project management tools are, are different. And so when you're recommending this to, to a client, you know, you're saying, okay, create two separate pieces of content for each, but you know, there's probably cases where the algorithm that you've built clusters things incorrectly or perhaps search intent shifts over yep. time. And what do you do in those cases where you created two separate pieces, but now Google or users or both are considering those two kind of like topics yep. Yep. the same? Yeah. So a good example of that is like HBO Max, HBO Go, HBO uh, regular because like they deprecate their tools like their 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 uh like their movie Plans. package Plans. every yeah. six months yeah. you know like so um so like one of the things like I didn't really cover it in, in the presentation but we calculate search intent as well that way we're able to kind of compare um the differences in search intent we do that um uh, like the high level initially 
is you know your standard navigational information. So we, we look at that and then we compare the difference between the two. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, like I said, most clients come to us to figure out like where we make the plans for them. So we'll go look at the SERPs and you you have to use experience to say, okay, they're two separate because the URLs are ranking different, right? But we ask ourselves like from a user's, from a search perspective, right? Like are people actually looking for the same thing? And if they are, we will initially create it as one page to see how like, just creating the, a better piece of content actually performs. Yeah. Um, and if it doesn't, then we split it out, but then we'll, uh, we usually run the data like every, I mean, really whatever frequency they want to, like normally like once a quarter is good enough, but uh, we'll run it every 90 days and then com- compare the score- historical results to see, okay, have things shifted, have a rank, you know, when it tells us how all the ranking lift has occurred too without, you know, of course you have rank trackers for that too, but it looks at it better from like a hub perspective, but We'll look to see have there been any changes, and if there have been, that's when we say it's the same. It's the same approach as what you would do if you had uh, two pages that were already competing together to begin with. You just say, okay, like how do I consolidate these two? Here's like a little tip for people that, that uh, uh, I haven't seen like a lot of people talk about. If you're trying to figure out if you got two pages that are competing together one with one another, and you're trying to figure out what piece of content, whether you want to consolidate them or whether you want uh, you know, page A to rank instead of page B. Um, and you're trying to figure out like, how do you make this happen? One of the best things to do is just look at the meta descriptions that Google is rewriting because they, they rewrite them like what, 60, 70% of the time now. It's a pretty good um, like idea of what content on your page that Google thinks is most relevant to that topic. And then you say, oh, let me remove it from that page and add it to this other one. It's like, it's, it's, it's very straightforward. And if that doesn't work, you just see what the new meta description they've created for you is. Um, but other than that, it's like I said, if you see that there's an intent shift, because uh, like I said, when we rerun the data, we'll say, okay, now we just collapse these two pages together. It happens. Um, not, not as much because we tend to go after like, so we build a bottom-up approach and we tend to go after uh, like long tail topics a lot of times first or yeah. depending, depending on how much content, because they just tend to convert better. So I didn't talk about that a lot either, but um, like we don't chase after like volume and traffic. We, we really look to see, uh, we like to like be able to go into Salesforce or into um, you know HubSpot or anything like that where they have data to figure out what's actually converting and use that to inform our um uh, our actual decisions that we make because the price score tells us where can we get the greatest lift from in terms of traffic and perceived value of like, if you had to pay for that traffic, what would it be worth and how much effort is it going to take you? But it doesn't necessarily tell you what it's going to actually be from a business metric sense, um, standpoint. We have to do that like after the fact. Um, so then we make those decisions based on that, but yeah, that's, that's our, uh, that's our standard approach. And it hasn't happened too much. It happened with the HTML stuff, though. That, that yeah. was actually one that we ran yeah, into. Yeah. So. yeah, no. Uh, one last comment from Ronaldo. He says, and I think he speaks for me and everybody as well, that's a crazy level of thought, detail, and testing that goes into the way you do things, Skylar. And we're very honored that you could join us sharing with you, us, your, your data, very heavy data-driven approach. And... Thanks for thanks for all the wisdom. Yeah, I appreciate uh, appreciate you having me on. Like I said, if anybody's got any questions, I'm always happy to. I'm not just a data nerd either. Like I, you know, I uh, I love content. I love writing. So if you ever want to talk about content and uh, and customer research or data, hit me up on LinkedIn. Yeah, I'll also provide an email where you can uh, yeah. reach out to Skyler after afterwards. I forgot email again. Yeah, that's <laughs> Okay, cool. Take care, everyone. Later.